All right. So let's talk about pre-hospital cardiac arrest. Um, we're going to talk about active resuscitation and also touch a little bit on ROSC. My caveat moving forward here is that protocols and guidelines vary significantly across the board from state to state and from county to county. So what we're going to talk about today are just some generalizations that may or may not be applicable to where you practice. So when we talk about whether we should be working our patients on scene or whether we should do a load and go type thing with patients in cardiac arrest, the short answer is that we should usually stay, right? And this is not new information. We have known for years now that patients who are worked on scene have a more favorable neurological outcome than patients who are just thrown into the back of the ambulance and worked en route to the hospital. So most guidelines now will dictate that patients should be worked on scene for 20-ish minutes or so. We know that when we're working these patients on scene, we do higher quality CPR, um, we do more timely rhythm checks, we do better BLS and better ALS. So it's just what makes sense. Sometimes we'll hear this argument, you know, but we have mechanical CPR devices and they certainly do make CPR so much easier if we do need to move or if we do have limited hands. But at the end of the day, they're not proven to improve outcomes. And so we're actually starting to see protocols address this and dictate a delayed application of these devices during the cardiac arrest so that there is not a interruption in those first few really important cycles of compressions in order to apply these devices. What are we doing when we're working these patients on scene? Well, the beauty of it is that most pre-hospital agencies are equipped to deal with a lot of the reversible causes in the same way that the ER would address them. So if there's an airway or ventilation issue, we should be able to address that via airway adjuncts, whether it is a BLS adjunct like an eye gel or uh, an ALS adjunct like an intubation. Um, we can also reverse issues with lower airway obstruction like with epi and our asthmatics and anaphylactic patients and so on. Volume loss can be addressed with fluid boluses and some agencies are carrying blood products as well. We of course can't reverse hyperkalemia in the pre-hospital setting, but if we suspect it, we can at least temporize it with calcium. We can warm our hypothermic patients. We can address tension pneumos with either needle decompression or a finger thoracostomy. And we can address the initial resuscitation of some of our overdoses as well. If a patient overdoses on a sodium channel blocker, um, like a TCA, then we can go ahead and get that sodium bicarb on board. And of course, um, a bit controversial, but we can address hypoglycemia if we believe that that is the etiology of arrest. Unfortunately, there are a couple pretty common causes of cardiac arrest pre-hospitally that we can't do anything about. And um, the two probably most worth talking about are OMI and pulmonary embolism because these patients do have a potentially reversible cause we just can't do anything about it in the field. And so these patients may warrant a bit more rapid transport, transport for PCI or EPCR if that option exists. We're starting to see eCPR e get written into um, these pre-hospital protocols for agencies that have an appropriate facility available to them. And so the protocols do vary from locality to locality, but they tend to have the same types of variables, which I'm sure many of you are familiar with. Things like age and weight of the patient, how long was the patient down, what rhythm did they present in? Many of these patients are going to be refractory V-fib or VTAC, but some protocols do allow for transport of um, PEA patients as well. Was there bystander CPR? Is the presumed etiology something that can be reversed uh, with these means? And what does the patient's history look like? These are the same patients that may come to you in the hospital if you're a hospital provider um, as a patient that was treated with vector change defibrillation or dual sequential defibrillation if they were in that refractory V-fib or VTAC and if those procedures are, are within that agency's scope. PEA is a bit of a gray area for us in the pre-hospital setting, especially when our patients are persistently in it because most of us don't have a way to determine is this true PEA with cardiac standstill or is this just a state of profound shock? 
Point of care ultrasound is working its way into the 911 pre-hospital setting, and it's only going to get more prevalent as time goes on. So luckily, some agencies are already starting to do this. They're starting to incorporate ultrasound into their cardiac arrest management so that they can tell on scene, is this a case of true cardiac standstill that hasn't been responsive to anything that we've been doing and we should call it? Or is this a pseudo PEA and the patient does have some cardiac motion, but they're just in profound shock and we need to treat and transport that patient. So again, this is just gonna become more common as time goes on. Trauma arrests in the pre-hospital setting historically were not worked unless they were witnessed. It was pretty uncommon to put much effort into these patients, but now we're recognizing that we had such low resuscitation rates because we weren't really trying, right? So uh, maybe some of these patients are viable. In the absence of injuries that are incompatible with life, most pre-hospital protocols are incorporating some sort of viability criteria where these patients can be worked. So if they have a presenting rhythm that's something other than asystole, we should probably give it a try. If they have any pupillary reactivity, we should probably give it a try. If they have agonal respirations, we should initiate that resuscitation, right? So protocols will vary wh regarding whether these patients should be worked on scene and reversible causes are addressed there or whether they should be rapidly transported to the closest trauma facility. But either way, um, there's a few reversible causes that we can address in the field. The first is airway. Was this a hypoxic or um, a ventilation issue that caused the arrest secondary to trauma? If so, we'll address it. We can do bilateral chest decompression or bilateral finger thoracostomies if the mechanism suggests that that is appropriate. And some ground agencies are starting to carry blood products as well, so that may be initiated. Across the board, we're seeing a deprioritization of compressions in epi because that is simply not what these patients need. CPR-induced consciousness is a phenomenon that is seen both in the hospital and in the pre-hospital setting, but it's becoming more prevalent, especially in our world pre-hospitally, uh, because of the use of these mechanical CPR devices. So these patients are receiving compressions that are so good that perfusion is actually restoring some of their neurological status during the active compressions. But when the compressions cease, the perfusion stops and the patient goes back into their um, cardiac arrest rest state because they don't have an underlying rhythm that is perfusing. These CPR-induced consciousness states can range from a little bit of eye-opening and small movements all the way to full awareness and patients who even interfere with their own resuscitation. And so finally, pre-hospitally, we're starting to acknowledge that this phenomenon exists and that it needs to be addressed so that the resuscitation can be performed appropriately and so that the patients are not traumatized by their experience if they remember it. And it's also not super enjoyable for the responders as well. And so while there's no consensus yet, as far as what pharmacology is best to sedate these patients, ketamine seems to be the go-to for a lot of agencies so that we can dissociate and sedate these patients during the arrest and perform the resuscitation as um, well as we possibly can. Once we do get ROSC on any of these patients, we know now that we need to rush less, right? If we just high-five each other and dart to the back of the truck, these patients have a really high likelihood of rearrest, which is quite the opposite of what we want, right? So um, we focus on stabilization on scene. Some guidelines will even dictate, you know, 10 minutes or so of a waiting period on scene so that we can obtain a full set of vitals and we can optimize those patients' um, hemodynamics as much as we possibly can. We also know that EKGs are far more accurate um, and less likely to have a false positive for STEMI or OMI if there is a bit of a delay in taking that 12 lead after obtaining ROSC. So eight minutes is tends to be the sweet spot. And so more and more guidelines are incorporating this as well, where providers will get an EKG initially and then they are asked to repeat that within eight to 10 minutes, or they are permitted to withhold the 12 lead until that eight minute mark um, and see what kind of reading they get there. But of course, we have to balance the risk of rearrest versus definitive care and what this patient actually needs, right? Because if we have a patient who's having an obvious MI and they code on us on scene 
and we work them and we get ROSC, we want to stabilize them and stop them from rearresting, but we also know that what they need is PCI, and that's not here on scene, right? We need to get them where they need to go. So the goal is to use clinical judgment and stabilize these patients as much as possible, give them the best chance at surviving transport, but also get them where they need to go as quickly as possible. And of course, we can't talk about cardiac arrest without at least mentioning Lazarus, aka uh, auto resuscitation. These case studies are some of the most crazy case studies to read, but this is when a patient has been pronounced dead after CPR has been performed. And then usually within 10 minutes or so of termination, they regain spontaneous signs of life. And some of these patients go on to actually walk out of the hospital, which is, which is nuts. So are some of these patients just the result of poor death determination skills? Probably yes. But there are definitely patients who have been documented dead via POCUS, the asystole and cardiac standstill have been confirmed for a significant period of time. And within several minutes after calling the the rest, and they do end up showing those spontaneous signs of life. Um, and so these case studies will recommend a waiting period after terminating a cardiac arrest. So once the efforts are ceased, we wait a few minutes before telling family, moving on with our lives, just to make sure that nothing like this happens. And so we're starting to see that trickle um, into a few pre-hospital protocols here and there, which is pretty interesting. So at the end of the day, pre-hospital resuscitation is usually best performed on scene. It's where we can do our most stable controlled work. Uh, we can address a lot of the reversible causes in the same way that the ER would, but those that we can't, like PE and MI, transport for PCI or ECMO are certainly maybe an option. When we do get ROSC on these patients, we know that we need to slow down and stabilize them for transport. And we also know now that our viable trauma arrests do deserve some attention from us. There's a few reversible causes that we can at least do our best to try and take care of on scene. And finally, our CPR-induced consciousness patients deserve sedation. So if your agency or your department doesn't currently have a protocol for that, it's something that you can advocate for. That's all I got for you guys. Thanks for having me.